What a delight to introduce you to Edward Tian, who's from Toronto, but he's a computer science and journalism student right now at Princeton University. Just finished a big assignment last night, right, right, Edward? But here you are with us early this morning, <laughs> and we couldn't be more excited. Uh, listen, Edward, so concerned about ChatGPT that he created his own app to counter it, and we're going to talk about that in some more detail. But first of all, good morning, Edward, and welcome. Good morning, Heather. Thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to the conversation, and I know our viewers are as well, because we've invited viewer questions this morning, knowing we were going to put them to you. And, you know, it's kind of surprising, because I think people really want to go to the basics. So we heard, for example, from Annette, I want to know everything about it. And we heard from Dave as well, similarly, talking about he has an NBA, so he's really smart, but he doesn't really understand chat GPT. So he, what he would like to know is please start with a basic lesson so his kids don't think he's a Luddite. So why don't we do that to begin to answer Dave and Annette's and others' questions, I'm sure. What is chat GPT, Edward, and how does it work? Yeah, totally. Um, so... I can hopefully answer this question as best I can. Even last summer, when I was uh, working at Microsoft, I was working with some of these chat GPT models already. So um, my understanding, and this is, this is sort of a, a simple way to put it, is that these large language models like chat GPT are in ingesting gigantic portions of the internet. Um, so, you know, terabytes and terabytes of data, and they're looking through it for patterns. And then when you're asking it something, it's regurgitating these patterns that it's seen by ingesting large portions of the internet to you know, generate uh, text and answer your questions um, you know, exactly like that. Okay, I think that's really, that's very helpful. So it access all of this data, and as Ellen said, uh, you know, analyzes the patterns and the connections and creates words and phrases, and very quickly, I mean, the speed at which it's answering is quite impressive, isn't it? Absolutely. It's, you know, entirely impressive. It's, you know, game changing for sure. But I would say it, one thing is that ChatGPT or these models aren't coming up with anything original. They're not reporting anything new. They're really regurgitating patterns that it's already seen on the Internet. OK, when it accesses these, this massive amount of data um, and then what can it be used for questions about the applications? I, I talked in the intro about essays and exam writing and poetry, et cetera. We had a question from James wondering whether, and this might be a good practical application, Edward, can I ask GPT to do a search for me? So James is interested in the St. John River in New Brunswick specifically, whether it was an important route used by Native Americans. Here's a, just a little bit more explanation. He's looking for some real detail before the Europeans discovered America. Can I ask for what purpose it was used? Could I ask it to give me the dates it was used? So those kinds of specifics, is that the kind of application chat GPT could find? This is a fascinating question. So that's actually not the type of application we would recommend ChatGPT for because we've seen a lot of shortcomings of people searching for specific railroads or rivers in Europe, for example, ChatGPT making up names of roads and rivers that sound really convincing. So we would say that in general, if you ask um, something like, hey, tell me about a really famous river, tell me about Lake Ontario, I'll do a good job because there's lots of information on the internet about that and it can regurgitate the most common patterns. But if you're asking about something really niche, maybe there's only been one or two articles on the internet about, and maybe those articles are wrong, then it's gonna tell you the wrong information. Uh, so that's not the recommended use case here. So that's really interesting because I mean, yeah. like anything, I mean, you've probably done this too. I've done a search, I have asked, chat GPT about myself and what I got back was not wholly accurate. So this is a big caveat we need to keep in mind. Exactly. So it cannot be all, it's not always correct. So it can be erroneous. So what I'm interested in, you mentioned a little bit of your background. You come home to yep. Toronto for Christmas break. You've heard mm -hmm. about chat GPT. It only really arrived on the scene in November. Here we are in April and it's already, you know, the worldwide phenomenon. What was it that first attracted your attention to chat GPT that you wanted to investigate further? Oh, for me, um, well, you know, finishing school right before break, I was in my last year of school and the hype around chat GPT was everywhere. Every, everybody on campus was talking about it. And I had been researching this technology 
for maybe more than uh, a year and a half at that point. But I was seeing the hype was all around, but no one then was building tools to know when it's used, to detect it, to see when it's used. I thought that was critically important, especially when we were releasing these new technologies um, that you know we build the safeguards to adopt it responsibly. I had previously um, you know looked at you know misinformation use cases where already in 2020 there were Facebook bots with AI generated faces um, you know spreading misinformation, and now imagine those bots can chat like a human and i thought that was definitely a, a scary world to, to enter in an exciting technology but also uh you know with with some problems for uh, abuse and misuse so then that's what motivated me over break to build gpd zero the ai detection tool um that you mentioned so I, it's just extraordinary sitting down at home on christmas break and you come up with gpt zero which detects plagiarism am i getting this right in 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 text that is generated by chat GPT. Tell us how a little bit about how it works, Edward. Yeah, so GPT Zero, um, you put in a piece of text and it's free for anybody to use at gpzero.me and it scans it and highlights the portions of the text that's more likely to be AI generated. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, we're also building a Chrome extension for it where you can browse the internet and you know click on these suspicious pages and it'll highlight not only what's more likely to be AI that you're reading and consuming uh, and, and knowing now AI information is everywhere on the internet, but also highlighting the most human parts, sort of the best writing and most important information. Uh, I would say since I launched it, over 4 million people have used it, which is which is just crazy. And uh, it was just myself, but now we have a team of nine undergrad and grad students. Um, you know, my co-founder just dropped out of his PhD at the University of Toronto to work work on this app, and it's, it's just been crazy since. Isn't that incredible? We're just in April. Four million people have looked to GPT-0 because they obviously share your concerns. I have time for one more question. I will hope you come back and talk to us again, Edward, because your, your knowledge of this is so fascinating. And obviously, this is a road that we're traveling and we need to be aware of what's going on. Just maybe a closing thought on, I, I mentioned in the introduction to <coughs> Ellen's uh, content that you know some people are they love the technology but is it going too far too fast where do you think we are right now with gpt4 for example uh, just out where are we now in terms of what the potential is versus the balance between the potential risks and consequences and how do we strike the right balance wow i think everybody that's been asking that's a that's a million dollar question here or maybe even more i would say right now a lot of people need to learn the shortcomings that this is not an end all be all answer to all our questions. It's great for getting people started. It's great for generating ideas at GPT, but there's a lot of problems for us to still solve in terms of toxicity, biases. These big tech companies that are building these models aren't incentivized to build the tools and the safeguards because they're just in a rush to build better models. So we really need an outside or a third party to start working on the safeguards so that these tools are adopted responsibly. Edward, I hope we can continue on the conversation. I appreciate the time today. Should we say hi to your family in Toronto? If they're seeing you, they're watching us this morning. Happy to know that you're working away at your assignment and still obviously brilliant. This, <laughs> we'll say hi to yeah, them. I will. And, I'll say hi to my mom and dad. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Listen. Listen, we'll keep track of GPT-04, million users and counting. And as I say, hopefully we can speak again. Edward Tian, thanks for the time today. Thanks so much.